This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is an opportunity to get acquainted with Mr. Craig Mullaney, to learn about his life, very interesting, and to hear about his book. Mr. Captain Mullaney is a former U.S. Army captain, graduated from the Military Academy at West Point, second in his class, became a ranger, airborne ranger, was a Rhodes Scholar, and uh, he's going to He's had, he's had a, for a young man, an amazing experience of leadership. So part of the opportunity to get acquainted with Captain Mullaney will be to learn a little bit together about the enigma of leadership. I hope he'll, it's in his book, and I hope he'll share a lot of that with us. So I'm often asked the question on the book tour, why at age 30 did you feel compelled to write a memoir? It's a bit premature. Um, I think I'm, I'm yet to live the sequel. Uh, but in many ways, I didn't write the book. The book wrote me. When I returned from Afghanistan in 2004, I still had a lot of the war inside me. There were battles left to fight. And in recording my experiences, that I felt some slipping away and others still as vibrant as the day, I experienced them. By writing, I could process that experience. But I also wrote the book for my soldiers. It was my burden to tell our story, not just my story. And blessed with the talents and, and education to try to write a compelling narrative of our experience. The third audience for my book was my brother, and my students. My brother, seven years behind me at West Point, that I knew would graduate and likely serve in Iraq and or Afghanistan. And as an instructor at the Naval Academy and the several hundred students that I taught, I felt a very real burden that what I didn't teach them could get them killed. And so I hoped by passing on what I'd learned, often the hard way, that they would be better leaders. And the last audience, as many of you, is the public. You know, often in the military, you might say the larger, the larger audience back home doesn't understand us, doesn't understand our experience. I don't think it's, I don't think it's for lack of, of trying. I think it's partly because our military is become a smaller and smaller segment of our, of our overall society, that we have an all-volunteer force. But instead of cursing the dark, I hope to light a candle. And in this book, to, to make it accessible, to strike every acronym from it, and to allow you uh, a glimpse into our world. So what is the book about? Well, in short, the book is about Start, it starts at West Point on my first day, and it ends with my brother's graduation 11 years later. But really, the book is about what I learned, how I learned it, and why I learned it. And I want to walk you through some stories and vignettes from the book, from West Point and Ranger School in Afghanistan, and give you a sense of what this soldier's education was. So I'll start with a, with a reading very early on at West Point. I think you'll like this. Some of you may have had shared this experience. Step up to my line. Do not step on my line. Do not step over my line. Step up to my line. A cadet glared at me under the black brim of a white service cap and swung his hand in front of his face. 
signaling that I should advance precisely to the line of demarcation pasted on the pavement in green tape. This was the first lesson in literal obedience. He was the cadet in the red sash, the first cadre member I needed to report to in order to join my company. I stood before him in a ludicrous uniform of newly issued cadet gym shorts, knee-high black socks, and Oxford low-quarter dress shoes. My head had been shorn of its five-inch locks, revealing a topography of old scars and virgin white scalp. Report, he bellowed at me from a distance of 18 inches. New Cadet Mullaney reports to the, the, are you stuttering while you report? His hot breath dried the sweat on my face. Yes, sir. Did I give you permission to stutter? No, sir. I began again. New Cadet Mullaney, stop. What did you do wrong? My newly bald scalp burned under the midday sun. Sir, I don't know. I don't know? I don't know, he repeated. Is I don't know one of your four responses? No, sir. What are your four responses, he asked, testing whether I remembered another cadet's instructions on answering questions. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. Sir, I do not understand. That's right, new cadet. Why did you study? Why did you stutter? Did you not have sufficient time to practice? I forgot, sir. <laughs> I could almost see smoke billow out of his ears. I forgot is not one of your four responses. Try again. No excuse, sir, I responded correctly. I must have replied, no excuse, sir, a thousand times that first year, hammering into my head an acknowledgment of personal responsibility that eventually became second nature. No excuse, sir, this lesson on day one of West Point is one of the first lessons and most important lessons to learn as a leader. That sense of responsibility on your shoulders that never goes away. And while a cadet with no real responsibility for lives, um, it doesn't have much impact later in combat with the lives of 25 young men who had parents and brothers and children it had an entirely different order of magnitude. The second major lesson of, of West Point is captured in a motto every cadet learns, which is cooperate and graduate. And this is a hard lesson to learn for many cadets, including myself, who had arrived at West Point because they'd been overachievers in high school who had largely succeeded on the basis of their own sort of merits and strengths. But at West Point, finds a way to break everyone, uh, whether in the classroom or on the athletic field or in your leadership training. Everyone has weaknesses that they have to work through. Uh, you know, one of the strangest rituals at West Point is sort of learning to eat in the West Point way. Meals during beasts were an exercise in targeted torture. Eating at West Point was a purely functional enterprise, meant to be as efficient as calisthenics, marching, and shooting. This was industrial engineering. Food was the input. Academic, physical, and military activities were the output. The mess hall is a six-story secular cathedral. Inside the heavy oak doors that face the parade field, the entire 4,000-person Corps of Cadets eats under the gaze of weathered flags and dead generals. Stained glass windows refract light through the outlines of armored knights and doughboys kneeling in prayer. Where the hall's six cavernous wings converge, a stone tower bulges to the ceiling 40 feet above. All commands emanate from this central pulpit, known bizarrely by naval terminology as the poop deck. On any given day in Beast, this is the, what they call basic training, we marched in, splintered by squad, and race walked to our assigned tables. Standing at attention was the last opportunity to catch my breath. Take seats, boomed a voice from the poop deck. A thousand wooden chairs scratched across the floor, and our squad sprung into action. Even meals were leadership opportunities. Bellinger was the table commandant, responsible for good order and discipline. 
The rest of us rotated through the remaining duties in a cacophony of clattering plates, shouts, and the occasional clang of an overturned pitcher. One of us scurried to the head of the table and checked that 11 and exactly 11 condiments had reported for duty and were prepared for action. A jar of Beat Navy brand peanut butter retained its aluminum seal. Conforming with protocol, the cadet unscrewed the cap and popped the seal by slamming the peanut butter jar into his forehead like a redneck crushing a can of beer. Another cadet skimmed gravy and announced it to the squad leader, according to protocol. The scum skimmed gravy is ready for inspection, sir. The cold beverage corporal and his sidekick by the ice bowl rapidly distributed ice water and sweet tea around the table. As new cadets, we were obliged to know the specific case of everyone, including the number of ice cubes Bellinger preferred in his cup, two. As waiters delivered food to 100 tables nearly simultaneously, they handed off their heaping platters of food at the foot of the table. After the mouth-watering tray, even mess hall food looks good to the famished, rotated around the table. A cadet held it up by his right ear at a 45 degree angle and announced the remaining number of portions. Five and a butt servings of mashed potatoes remaining, sir. Only after all the table duties were complete could we begin eating. Since every mistake during table duties cost precious time, we ate very little during those first few weeks. A particularly egregious error like the time I forgot to split the salad bowls into two equally sized towers could result in having to touch the mural. A command that evoked as much dread as being told to reach one's hand into a python's nest. After gathering courage, I shot toward the southeastern wing of the mess hall, eyes locked straight ahead on a 1,000 square foot mural celebrating military history. And just when I was close enough to touch George Washington, a cadre member snagged my shirt, held me hostage, and grilled me to discover whatever alleged offense had sent me into his lair. The next time, I split the salad bowls like a pro. When we did eat, it was anything but natural. We sat through hour-long blocks of instruction on Connecticut, as it was known at West Point, and practiced the 19th century manners we were taught. We sat exactly one fist distance away from the table, plate one thumb joint away from the edge, eyes focused on the West Point crest at the plate's 12 o'clock. We never spoke unless addressed by the squad leader. Collective punishment was the law of the table. An error by one stopped everyone else from eating. Even when there was pause to eat, it took forever to get anything into my stomach. Eating required its own entry in the little book of cadet knowledge we carried everywhere like a passbook from hell. The tone was set with the epigraph. Tomorrow's battles are won during today's training. Then point by point were instructions for eating as detailed as a field manual. First, pick up your fork. Second, pick up your knife. Third, cut one piece, replace knife, switch fork to the other hand, stab, lift, and insert food into mouth. Replace fork. Chew no more than three times. Start again. Bellinger's well-trained eye looked for exactly three bobs of the jaw. Pity the new cadet who attempted four or five big bites. It might cost the table the remainder of the meal. By the end of the first week, we were starving. Over time, we ate earlier and faster. It was us against them, and the only way to win was to cooperate and graduate the first principle of cadet life. I think I found, like many of my peers, that teamwork as a leader was, the, was perhaps the most important thing I could train. It didn't matter whether I had 40 expert riflemen if they didn't know how to fire in collaboration with each other. They had to trust each other enough to sort of run into a wall of lead to save their men, to save another. You had to know that the man on your left and the man at your right were always watching your back. I think in combat, there's only one true luxury. It's in, found in the, your relationships with each other. And the cohesive, competent team can do anything.
So after I finished West Point, exactly eight days later, I arrived at Ranger School. Ranger School is, is sort of like a doctorate in endurance. Uh, it should be about a 60-day course if you do everything right. You average three hours of sleep a night. Uh, most rangers will have lost 20 to 30 pounds by the time they're finished. Um, and over these 60 days in swamps and mountains and woodland environment, you learn, uh, you, you're rotated through leadership positions so that you learn how to lead under stressful conditions. So they mimic the stress of combat by depriving you of food and sleep. Um, which, as it, as it turns out, is also something I, I experienced in Afghanistan, a lack of food and sleep, at least when the bullets were flying. Um, so at Ranger School, I learned, I learned something about endurance. And it's captured in, uh, in one of the stanzas of the Ranger Creed. This, there's a, stan, a stanza for each letter of Ranger. It's like airborne cadence, and there's a Ranger cadence. And the uh, sort of the Ranger one is, surrender is not a Ranger word. I learned this firsthand, boxing. So at West Point, during your plebe year, they, they put you through boxing class. I always had it right before calculus. <laughs> so I had 10 minutes to change and get to my calculus class with somewhat foggy head, because I was not a very good boxer. <laughs> I had a record of 0 and 4, and the only reason I passed the class was because, as my instructor said, I, I fell gracefully. <laughs> So this is, a, again, sort of in a sport I'm clearly, uh, clearly not meant for with a glass jaw. At, at Ranger School, um, they, they put you through boxing matches again. So on this one particular afternoon in the first week, the Ranger instructors corralled us into a 12-foot squares for boxing matches. It was only a 15-second bout. And all I needed to do was jab enough with my left to keep my opponent at arm's length. I jabbed and jabbed. But some instinct kicked in when I saw his left side open up. I went for the kill with a right cross and threw my shoulder out again. I have a chronic dislocation in my shoulder. It's, I didn't realize until I wrote the book how many times it happened at key points in my life. Everything except my wedding. Um, so I, I go to throw this right cross. I throw my shoulder out again. 30 seconds, I woke up lying on my back. Ranger, you're going to the clinic. A ranger instructor stood over me like the Eiffel Tower. I struggled in vain to dissuade the ranger instructor. Fortunately, I had better luck convincing the medic that I could continue with the course. But for a moment, sitting on the examination table, I considered quitting. Dozens had already quit. In ranger parlance, they had LOM'd, lack of motivation. At West Point, I had always risen to the challenges. The challenges of ranger school, however, were on a different scale. And I wondered whether I could take two more months of punishment at this voltage. At the moment, motivation was scarce. A medical drop was an honorable reason to leave ranger school, I rationalized to myself. No one would call me a coward or a failure if I had a legitimate medical excuse. It was the easy way out. I could be on a plane home to Rhode Island in 12 hours sitting by the pool with a margarita. Covered in mud and sweat, the prospect was especially appealing. Ranger school could wait a couple of years, I told myself, maybe after Oxford. Another voice, however, urged me to stay. This sort of decision had an audience of one. Forget my, what my father would say as he picked me up at the airport. Forget my mentors. Would I be able to look at myself in the mirror again if I quit? So I stayed in the course a decision I would curse during every painful march or sleepless night staring out at the dark from a cold patrol base. There were no good days in ranger school, just variations of bad. It demanded an almost inhuman level of endurance. I mounted the pull-up bars that night and strained with one good arm to knock out my 11 repetitions. As we stood outside and shouted the six verses of the ranger creed, I shouted six words louder than the rest. And for the rest of the course, I repeated those words to myself whenever the temptation to quit resurfaced. Surrender is not a range of word. So that was my education and endurance.
And I had another, ended up 10 or 12, I think 10 more weeks of ranger school to go. Um, but I think what's, you know, I tried to capture on the, I tried to capture in the writing how I experienced the moment as I experienced it psychologically. And the question I asked myself was whether I could look myself in the mirror. And that's not really the relevant question. And I don't think I learned why I was really there until a little bit later in ranger school. This was, I think, the most important lesson I learned. So, so I sort of described how we had these long marches. Over ranger school, you walk the equivalent of Boston to like Philadelphia with 100, 100 pounds on your back. Ranger school, in essence, was one long, miserable, loud, and uncoordinated movement to dawn. On one of these all-night suck fests, we pulled into our patrol base a few hours before dawn and spread out in a circle facing the dawn, facing the night. We exchanged the coordinates of a rally point in case we were overrun, and a handful of rangers took watch while the rest of us passed out in impromptu fighting positions. I fell asleep, confident I would get an hour of shut-eye. I awoke to machine gun fire. Muzzle flashes sparked around the patrol base as sleeping rangers lurched awake and fended off the attack. But no one fired back. I couldn't figure out why. When the dust settled, I realized what had happened. Our watch had fallen asleep, leaving no security against an enemy attack. The RI had made a point of our laughs by depressing the trigger of our machine gun. Our failure to stay awake was understandable. We had been operating continuously for well over 40 hours without sleep. Wake up, Rangers. If you can't stay awake, I'm going to help you. He had the authority of God issuing Moses the Ten Commandments. Get on the road, now. Move it, Rangers. We lined up on a sandy road somewhere in Cortinia and awaited our punishment. We're going walking. He bounded ahead at speed walking pace. He wasn't wearing a rucksack. And we strained to keep up. Let's go, Rangers. We've got a long walk. We followed behind for miles. The moon cast our shadows along the road. We walked long enough to see the moon shadows lengthen. Eventually, he slowed down and faced our squad. He moved down the rank slowly, examining each face like a witness checking out a police lineup. He asked each of us one simple question. Why are you here? The answers were predictable, ranging from for the challenge to my platoon sergeant made me. I admitted with the other infantry officers that I hadn't had a choice. Wrong answer, Ranger, he said to each person before addressing the group. You are here for one reason. You are here for the troops you are going to lead. You are responsible for keeping them alive and accomplishing whatever mission you're given. I don't care if you're tired, hurt, or lonely. This is for them, and they deserve better. You owe them your ranger tab. Screw self-pity, he said with a hiss. This isn't about you. And I think that's when I learned a bit about what I would expect of sacrifice and service. Let's talk a bit about Afghanistan. So Afghanistan's in the news a lot these days after six years of very little news. I arrived in Afghanistan in the summer of 2003, which was the same time that the insurgency in Iraq really sparked. So these are some of the instructions that we got in order to prepare for our deployment to Afghanistan and how to sort of recreate Afghanistan in your own home. Renovate your bathroom. Hang a green plastic sheet from the middle of the bathtub and keep four inches of soapy cold water on the floor. When you take showers, wear flip-flops and keep the lights off. 
Second way to prepare. Keep a roll of toilet paper on your nightstand and bring it to the bathroom with you. And bring a gun and a flashlight as well. Number three, cut a hole in your vacuum bag and every morning run the vacuum through your house to get an appreciation for dust. Four, first thing in the morning, make everyone in your family brief what he or she did yesterday. At the end of the day, make everyone brief you what he or she did during the day. Do this every day, seven days a week. And fifth, and probably most uh, appropriate, go to the worst crime-infested place you can find wearing a flak jacket and a Kevlar helmet. Set up shop in a tent in a vacant lot. Announce to the residents that you're there to help them. So how do you prepare, how do you really prepare for, for Afghanistan? I mean, it's a, a, a strange foreign culture for most Americans, certainly for most of, my, most of my soldiers and my peers, many of whom had never left the United States. Um, in some ways, it was like kind of moving back in time six centuries. Um, but I think what we're learning how to do in the military better than we did before was to find comfort and ambiguity. And something the Marine Corps has a long history of doing well. Uh, I don't know if we have any Marines in the audience. I recognize I'm kind of the army of one here in a Navy town. Um, but in, the, in their small wars manual from 1940, I think they sort of captured the, the challenge of Afghanistan aptly. Small wars are conceived in uncertainty are conducted with precarious responsibility and doubtful authority under indeterminate orders lacking specific instructions. So no, very, not a very clear mission uh, without a, a very clear understanding of, of the culture we were operating in. And in 2003, we were still, I think, stumbling into better counterinsurgency practices. Um, but this is where I think, going back to What's the fourth response at West Point? Sir, I do not understand. Well, the appropriate, the appropriate reaction is, sir, I do not understand from an upperclassman to say, uh, well, go find out. Or if you don't know, seek out the answers. And establishing the habit of mind um, to say, to be able to say, I do not understand when you really don't. And to then seek out the answers and to form a habit of of curiosity that's a particularly important when you're operating in an ambiguous environment. You don't need to necessarily know all the answers when you arrive, but you need to know the questions to ask. Um, you know, in many ways, in Afghanistan, the closer you look, the less you understand. It is such a complex society or each you think you you might un look I've, I've got it I understand what the major tribes are in my area but do you understand how they interact do you understand their history of feuds and rivalries because we would often find ourselves caught in between sort of warring factions the Hatfields and McCoys each one would sort of rat on the other oh they're t you know they're Taliban oh no 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 they're Taliban and you're left trying to figure out well, what I mean I don't know who's who uh, and I don't speak the language. And I'm trying to try to mime, try to mime my way into understanding the local culture. Um, but I think the the lesson of the lesson of of West Point, and partly for me, the lesson of studying abroad in England and traveling widely, was to be comfortable in that ambiguity, and to learn to ask questions. Um, and to always question the answers. Because the challenge isn't always completing the mission, it's figuring out what the mission is in the first place. So we use this term hearts and minds all the time. Um, and I'll say that I waged my first hearts and minds campaign when I launched a six week wooing offensive of my wife whose family is from South India. And in attempting to win her heart, I learned Hindi, traveled to India, took an Indian history course, read every book of literature I could find, including some rather boring 
uh, pieces. Um, I even ate curried okra. <laughs> and uh, I think the, le the lesson I took from that wooing offensive, which eventually was successful, clearly, was that you've got to meet someone on their own turf. And, and to arrive in Afghanistan, and it wasn't, it was about figuring out what the local population needed and how we could best serve them. Because an insurgency is ultimately a contest for the political loyalty of the civilian population and who can better provide justice and security and opportunity, the insurgents or the legitimate elected government and its international backers. And I think I found that many of our best missions, the ones that had the largest and longest impact, were those that you might, you might call a hearts and mind mission. Um, so I thought I'd read to you uh, a couple of those. Um, I, I won't read to you about the camel riding incident. You'll have, to, you'll have to buy the book to learn about that. Again, something they don't teach you at West Point. So we, a lot of our missions, as you might imagine, in Afghanistan were those where you know, bullets were flying, but not every mission was quite so dramatic. I accompanied the reconstruction team on a mission once where we moved school books from an old Taliban warehouse to a local school. From floor to ceiling, bundles of books were stacked. They spilled out of their burlap sacks across every flat surface in giant mounds. I saw a school workbook written in English. It was a primer for elementary school students. On the back of the book was a list of mottos students should memorize. And so this is, um, this was, I think, a, a series of books that uh, US funding uh, helped get into Afghanistan in the 80s and 90s. But these mottos certainly took me by surprise. Uh, Jihad is our path. I paged through the short glossary of 100 words in the back of the primer. It had far more military terms in it than one would expect for a grade school English book. Bayonet, garrison, overrun, invade, capture. To explain the grammatical concept of a clause, the following example was used. The Mujahideen ran up the mountain, but he was not tired. The reading exercises featured constructions such as, were you trained by your commander before you started armed jihad? In case the student was unsure what training might be necessary, the reading exercises went on to remind him, the battle wasn't fought before my brother oiled his gun. He could use light and heavy arms, even anti-aircraft machine guns too. And to emphasize why such struggle was necessary for Afghans, each student would read the categorical statement, wherever there are Russians, there is cruelty. I had read earlier that the Russians disguise minds as children's toys. But until I read these children's primers, I hadn't really absorbed the full measure of Afghanistan's misery. For nearly 30 years, the country had been at war, and suffering was woven into the fabric of Afghan society. The headmaster of the local school greeted us with a large smile. In a province where fewer than one in three adults could read, his work was heroic. In addition to the books, we deposited with him pencils, school backpacks, and a dozen soccer balls. I took a peek inside his classroom. There were only a few seats in the room, no chalkboards, and no light except the natural light flooding in from the oversized windows. The Natalie dressed headmaster thanked us profusely and asked us to pose for a group photo. I obliged, but in the back of my head, I wondered what good it was to recycle Mujahideen propaganda. The next generation of Afghans was the one we needed most for Afghanistan's long-term stability, but it was the hardest demographic of all. Walking through town on patrol, I often felt like the Pied Piper of Gardez, trailing children behind me in anticipation of more food, water, or candy. How are you? Give me water. How are you? Give me food, mister. We must have looked like alien invaders, with our laser sights, reflective sunglasses, and dangling antennas. They called us the hem helmeted ones. I thought about gesturing with three fingers and addressing them in jest. Greetings, we are from planet Earth. We are here to help you. I walked, the kids laughed and smiled and ran laps around squad and hand-me-down pajamas and bare feet. 
Red gave one of the kids some sweets, sec secreted away in his cargo pocket. The flock swarmed around him like a celebrity. Ten steps away stood their elders, their faces spelled indifference. I asked a few questions through my interpreter. Have you seen any bad men in the village lately? Have the police been through recently? The answer was always no. But I asked anyway for the report I needed to fill out when I returned. What happened between ages 8 and 18? It occurred to me that it would be the same if strange men with guns and sunglasses walked through my hometown. The strangers would be a curiosity for the young and an intrusion for the old. Years of training had shaped the way I interpreted my environment. Every door and crooked tree was a potential ambush. I peered at shadows and expectation of trouble and searched for cover that my men and I could use to protect us. Military officers planned for the worst and hoped for the best. Stay alert and stay alive. This attitude was well suited for a battlefield or training exercise, but Gardez was neither. I wasn't prepared to walk through a village that was neither friendly nor enemy. I wanted to take kids' pictures, not imagine them in suicide vests. This was the frustration in microcosm, how to stay focused on protecting my men while simultaneously engaging the local population. One pundit called this armed social work, evoking the image of Peace Corps volunteers with pistols. The real difficulty, however, was psychological, seeing every local as indeterminate, neither friend nor foe, but, but potentially both at different times and different circumstances. Lieutenant Colonel LeCamer's warning echoed in my head. Be polite, be professional, be prepared to kill everyone you meet. I think that's a sort of a difficult, uh, and it's probably the most difficult psychological thing to work through in a counterinsurgency environment where your enemy isn't wearing a uniform. Finding your friends is almost as important as finding your enemies or perhaps more so. But there are other days where I felt less conflicted. And the best day I had in Afghanistan, I thought I'd share with you. We, uh, we set up, we call this Operation Doolittle. Uh, over the course of five days, we were going to provide veterinary and medical care to a local a, a nomadic tribe called the Kuchis. Um, this was certainly not something I, I knew how to, how to prepare for. I, I set up the security perimeter, and we allowed the doctors and the veterinarians to do most of the work. Um, and I was a bit skeptical at first of why we were, why we had sort of stopped looking for the bad guys and were spending this time helping the local population. I think ultimately, in retrospect, the five-day Operation Doolittle was much more effective than any of the search and destroy movement to contact missions. In the afternoon, an elderly man arrived carrying his paralyzed wife on his back. He had walked nearly 10 miles. There was little our doctors could do. Another young man came limping to the makeshift clinic, his lower leg lacerated with shrapnel. He had stepped on one of the thousands of mines littering the mountains. During the 80s, the Soviets had carpeted, had carpeted entire ridge lines to deny their use to the Mujahideen. Many of the minefields remained unmarked, and only a fraction of the known mines had been removed. An Afghan medical student removed the visible shrapnel, applied an antibacterial cream, and bandaged the leg giving careful instructions on how to keep the wound clean. Outside, the field looked like the Washington County Fair that my father used to take me to when I was a kid. 20 years and 7,000 miles later, I stood before hundreds of animals of every shape, size, and smell, bobbing above the fray like bright buoys with the vibrant orange, yellow, and red headscarves of eight-year-old shepherdesses and the floppy boonie caps of soldiers. The veterinarians are dressed in khaki overalls and manage the pandemonium with ease, clearly in their element. I join the assembly line for the task of shooting syringes of deworming medicine into the mouths of bleeding sheeps. Sheep. 
Sorry. As we counted sheep, a Civil Affairs soldier made a tick on his clipboard and branded each sheep with spray paint, U.S. The vets handed the larger animals, camels, donkeys, and horses. They set broken bones, shoed hooves, and bandaged wounds. I turned to see one vet with his arm up the butt of a cow as far as his bicep. Now that is love of country, I thought. <laughs> While the doctors were able to treat only a couple of hundred people, the vets handled more than 5,000 livestock. The coochie depended on their herds for sustenance, clothing, and shelter. The value of a dairy cow or camel was a family's life savings and insurance. And winning the hearts and minds of the tribes, army vets were worth their weight in gold. I'm going to skip over the camel riding incident, which is embarrassing. Uh, an army photographer later provided me with copies of the photos he took during the mission. And one, an adolescent girl is sitting on her heels and staring at the camera, her bright pink dress standing in stark contrast to a strand of barbed wire in an olive drab tent. And another, a grandmother with deep wrinkles on a sunburned face, holds a young boy in her arms. His eyes are sapphires glittering in the desert sun, but his empty stomach is distended from parasites. These photos stand side by side in my office with pictures of the battlefields on which we fought and sacrificed. War is not only terror and exhilaration, courage and cowardice. It can also be the protection and comfort provided to the innocent. For a few days, that is what we were able to do for regular Af Afghans caught in the crossfire of a war they never asked for. While I may never be able to point to a tangible result of our countless patrols and brush fire skirmishes, my soldiers will always be able to look back on that mission as a time when we put our weapons down and helped heal a broken country. It may be proud to be an American soldier. So does everyone know that today is Dr. Seuss, would be Dr. Seuss's 105th birthday? If you looked on Google today, they, they changed the Google lettering to the, you know, the cat in the hat and the other characters. Well, I, I share an alum, uh, sort of an alumni connection with Dr. Seuss. He was a student at Lincoln College at Oxford. And uh, based on my experience of, of English cooking, I think in Lincoln College may have been the inspiration for green eggs and ham. <laughs> You know, in honor of Dr. Seuss, I, I, I looked for a, an, an epigraph that would help me make my, my sort of next point. And he had, a, he had a, a story, he said, if I ran the circus. All ready to put up the tents for my circus, I think I will call it the Circus McGurkis. <laughs> and now comes an act of enormous enormance. No former performers perform this performance. Now, my battalion commander, who is less poetic than Dr. Seuss, his, uh, he used to tell us, no one pays to watch a one-ball juggler. <laughs> that the task of a, of a leader in combat is to, is to manage this chaos, this circus, and to keep all those balls in the air without dropping a single one. And uh, that was certainly my experience. The title chapter of the book, The Unforgiving Minute, is about a fight that took place on Lozano Ridge, a half mile inside Afghanistan on the border with Pakistan. One of my soldiers, a 19-year-old from Haverhill, Massachusetts, was killed in the fight in the initial salvo. And after processing that, the rest of the firefight unfolded. Bullets snapped through the air, but the muzzle flashes were harder to isolate. I had my gunners lob dozens of grenades at the spark of every enemy muzzle they saw. Still, the distinct hammering of enemy machine guns and the crack of sniper fire remained. My men were firing everything they had. Although I had a rifle, I couldn't pick out targets that wouldn't risk hitting my own men below me. The only weapon of any use was the radio. It became my eyes and ears as well as my voice. 
I pieced together what had happened to O'Neill from the radio traffic among my squad leaders. Grens had moved under withering fire, recovered O'Neill's exposed body, and moved him to a sheltered position down the slope. O'Neill had been shot three times below the body armor, sharing a main artery. A medic in McGurk dressed the wound in vain, but O'Neill had already hemorrhaged too much blood. That is when McGurk had reported him KIA. I need a litter de team down here ASAP, screamed Story over the radio. He wanted to move O'Neill back up the hill for evacuation by medevac helicopter. If we got him to the doctors fast enough, maybe it wouldn't be too late. Behind me, the whine of worn out brakes made me turn my head around quickly. Chuck maneuvered his Humvees to positions offering better fields of fire. His long experience with heavy weapons in the Marine Corps was proving valuable. Below, Grenz dodged RPGs to get a hold of his radio and started marking enemy positions with smoke rounds from his grenade launcher. A shower of hot brass casings tumbled like quarters off the side of a nearby Humvee as Markham fired five second bursts of the 50 cal at Grenz's targets. Markham was a master, timing the length of his burst to balance firepower and accuracy. The rounds ripped along the border, shattering trees into showers of thick splinters. Even at a range of a mile and a half, a 50 caliber bullet hit with the force of a 44 Magnum at point blank range. Story was back on the radio, angry. I need that litter team, where are they? Running at a crouch between Humvees, I grabbed every soldier on the hill who wasn't firing a heavy machine gun or driving. I sent three down the steep slope toward the sheltered position where O'Neill had been moved. They skidded down the slope like their boots were on fire. Rounds kicked up dirt around them as they slalomed to avoid enemy fire. LeCamer used to say, no one pays to watch a one ball juggler. Well, if combat was a circus, I was in the center ring juggling a dozen flaming torches, piecing together fragments from three radio frequencies, coordinating a half dozen weapon systems, and dodging the rounds ricocheting off Humvee doors and furring the dirt near my position. It was loud and chaotic, and I wanted to piss in my boots, which was exactly how an officer had described combat to me in Normandy five years before. And just as he said it would, the sense of conf confusion dissipated as I gained my bearings, Confidence replaced dread. Eventually, incoming fire slowed. For the second time that afternoon, the battle looked as if it was over. It seemed as though we had been fighting for hours, but when I glanced at my watch, I realized that fewer, 20 minutes, fewer than 20 minutes had elapsed since Greg Grenz triggered the enemy ambush. So in Normandy, I had asked, the question, how would I respond to the question, what, what do we do now, sir? And I found in Afghanistan the answers. So the last thing I learned in Afghanistan, and one I didn't fully understand until long after I'd come back, was something about courage. Have any of you read The Red Badge of Courage? By Stephen Crane, sort of mandatory reading in high school. Well, I read it like everyone else and didn't know quite what to make of it at age 15. It seemed a bit remote, a Civil War battlefield. So as we uh, were ready to return home from Afghanistan, we arrived in Kandahar. This was the sort of purgatory for us to wash off the war before we went back home. I sat in, a, I sat in this sort of refugee type tent where they'd housed our whole battalion while we waited to leave. Sweat dripped onto my dog-eared copy of the Red Badge of Courage. Crane had written his masterpiece about a young soldier in the Civil War without ever stepping on a battlefield. As a high school student, I had wondered with a groan why I had to read it. The Civil War was ancient history. What was courage to a 15-year-old? It made no sense of that age, but it made sense now. Henry Fleming, the main character of the book, is a young soldier in the Union Army. He isn't sure how he will stand up in battle. He postures along with the others, 
cloaking his fears and bombast. In his first test under fire, he runs. When next pressed into battle, Henry rises to the challenge, carrying the colors forward under withering fire. He redeems his shame. But in both fights, fear is a constant. It is Henry's will to face that fear that changes. I tore through the book, scribbling in the margins. Henry's meditations on courage intrigued me now that I observed courage firsthand. If, as some of Henry's fellow soldiers contended, courage was an immutable characteristic, then you either had it or you didn't. You were either a hero or a coward. But that wasn't what I had observed. In combat, men were all heroes and cowards at the same time and in varying degrees. All my training had been one pressure cooker. Hazing, jumping out of planes, wrestling, ranger patrols, boxing, even travel. West Point taught us in boxing that fatigue makes cowards of men. Pain is weakness leaving the body. Perhaps courage was more like a muscle than an innate character trait. Maybe courage was a capacity for chaos and danger that increased with exposure. Maybe the fight at Lozano Ridge, with its pressure and pain, had prepared me for the next battle. Maybe combat was both the ultimate test of courage and its classroom. So why read a book about war if you'll never fight? Well, I don't think these are military lessons. I think these are lessons for all of us. I think in my story, it's about growing up. It's about learning responsibility and teamwork and camaraderie and commitment. A little bit of endurance, sacrifice and service, confidence, competence, making our way in a world of ambiguity, understanding each other. And it really, it's about love and family and commitment. And those aren't military values. Those are American values. After I finished the book, I did the one thing that I wasn't able to do while I was in uniform. And it was to take a draft of the book to Evan O'Neill's parents and to drive up to Andover and to sit down with them and for them to walk me through all the albums of Evan's childhood and high school. They had every essay he'd written as a high school student. They had his college applications. They had uh, pictures from his funeral and from his wake. On the day he came home from Afghanistan, his father is a, a firefighter in North Andover. And they had the entire, it seemed like the entire firefighter force from across northern Boston that went to Logan Airport and escorted the casket to the, to the funeral home. And when they had the funeral, more than 2,000 people showed up, including the governor of Massachusetts at the time, Mitt Romney. And he described to me how much Evan's death had impacted his community, the fiance he left behind, his teachers, the students that he looked at look up to him. And I think that taught me something that, that many of you might also recognize. And it's the military isn't them, the military is us. It's our brothers and sisters and cousins our students, our neighbors. Thank you for having me here today. I look forward to taking your questions. So if you've got your note cards, I guess you pass them to the aisles, and we'll bring them up front, and I can pick a selection.